Mrs. Martin was sitting on a bench near the old, rather shabby house, watching the sunset. Her son Frank had once bought it for almost nothing, renovated it a little, set up a small garden on the plot, and every summer he took the family out into the countryside. More precisely, he used to leave Mrs. Martin here with her grandson Tommy until the fall. The boy liked to stay in the country, the forest, the river, the neighbour children, and Mrs. Martin felt very well in the village too, although at first she did not really want to go there. The village was far from the city, and the elderly woman feared at some point to remain without a quick doctor's help or food. Her son usually brought everything she needed, so over time Mrs. Martin got used to it and was quite happy with her life in the countryside. But time passed. Tommy grew up and did not come to the village so often anymore, and most of the neighbours, especially the elderly, also left the village for the benefits of civilization. This summer, Mrs. Martin also was not going to go there, but she could not stand the constant scandals with her daughter-in-law, and literally ran away from the city. Megan used to restrain herself somehow, but when Mrs. Martin sold her apartment so that Frank could buy a larger house and moved in with her son, her daughter-in-law stopped being shy. Therefore, Frank, in order not to inflame the situation, as soon as spring came, always took his mother to the summer cottage, left her groceries, and occasionally came to replenish supplies. But Mrs. Martin was not despondent. She grew her own vegetables in the garden, and even learned to bake real rye bread, which she loved so much. However, most of all, Mrs. Martin was lacking of communication. In the village there was only an old neighbour, who did not always recognise Mrs. Martin, but it was better to be in the son's house, where they did not consider it necessary to discuss anything with her, and even her grandson Tommy began to treat her with disdain. So it turned out that the old summer house became a real salvation for Mrs. Martin, but this time Frank, as if he forgot about his mother. Food was running out, closer to fall it became chilly in the house, and Mrs. Martin could not chop her own firewood. To get warm somehow, the woman often went to the woods for brushwood, but the branches quickly burned out, and at night she had to sleep under several blankets. Of course, she could have had groceries delivered, but the card on which Mrs. Martin received her pension had long been with her daughter-in-law, because she believed that her mother-in-law did not need money. She lived on everything ready-made. Mrs. Martin could not reach her son or daughter-in-law. Upset, she did not immediately notice any strange movement near the fence. She assumed that it was a hedgehog, wandered in to visit, and with a smile thought that now she would have at least some creature to communicate with, except she had no milk to give her guest. She got up from the bench and hurried to the rhubarb bushes by the fence, and was very surprised to see a cute little puppy instead of a hedgehog, which was tangled in the tall grass. Instantly forgetting her sorrows, Mrs. Martin rushed to the rescue and took the dog in her arms. Looking closely, the woman realised that it was not a puppy, but an adult York Terrier. Mrs. Martin had seen such on television, in the arms of many celebrities. "'Where did you come from, little one?' the woman mouthed thoughtfully. The young dog looked good-natured, quite well-fed, but all his fur was piled up and covered with lumps of dirt. Mrs. Martin decided that although she had a little firewood, but it was necessary to boil water immediately, to bathe the guest, and to clean up his fur. The dog did not resist at all, and only looked at Mrs. Martin curiously, puffing, funny, and sticking out his pink tongue. After the water treatment, the woman decided to feed the dog, but he refused the offered pumpkin oatmeal. Guessing that he must be used to entirely different food, Mrs. Martin went to the fridge and 
for a small piece of cheese, which she had been saving, and only occasionally cut off a small slice and enjoyed the treat at dinner. Upon smelling the cheese, the dog got excited and even whimpered, and then greedily began to eat the grated cheese sprinkled oatmeal. I'll call you Archie, smiled Mrs. Martin, and froze in tenderness, watching the briskly chewing dog. Archie happily wagged his tail, and rising on his hind legs, began to lick Mrs. Martin's fingers, as if to thank her for the treat. Mrs. Martin almost cried. They went to sleep together, huddled together under the two blankets, and she was swept with a wave of affection and love for this cute little creature. And so the two of them lived together. Mrs. Martin's life began to play with new colours, except that neither her son nor daughter-in-law called, and this increasingly worried the woman. There was almost no food left, and even a piece of cheese left by Mrs. Martin for Archie had run out. However, the dog, as if understanding the complexity of the situation, ate all that he was given. Not capricious. Meanwhile, Mrs. Martin's anxiety for her family grew with each passing day. At last, she guessed to call their neighbour and found out that the whole family had gone to Turkey for holidays and would be back not earlier than in five days. Mrs. Martin was sad, but then she remembered that she still had a few cans of stew and decided that she would make soup with vegetables and she and Archie would somehow have enough to live on. And soon Frank called. Without even asking how his mother was doing, the man attacked her with accusations that she was constantly calling and that communication abroad was expensive. Then he heard about the dog. He finally lost his temper. Are you out of your mind? He snapped into a shout. Do you want to bring another dependent into the house? Don't even think about it. Unable to listen any further, the woman turned off the phone and burst into tears. She did not understand how it had happened that her beloved son had become so rude and ruthless and that she had become a dependent to him. The woman hugged Archie and went to bed, realising that no one in the world needed her now, except this little creature. But Mrs. Martin could not sleep. All she could think was how would she live in this unfitful winter house, because now she had no way to the city. In the morning, the woman heard a car pull up to the house and hurried outside. She was sure that her son had come to his senses and came to get her, but she was wrong. There was an expensive black jeep at the fence, and a tall, smiling young man hurried to her porch. "'Good morning, ma'am,' he greeted Mrs. Martin. "'I'm sorry to bother you so early, but maybe you've met a—' He didn't get a chance to finish, because Archie was already running toward him with a loud bark. The man grabbed the dog in his arms and held him tightly to him. "'Sparky, my dear! There you are!' he shouted happily. Seeing the dog squealing and licking the guest's face, Mrs. Martin understood everything and cried. The stranger, noticing this reaction, thinking that the woman was ill, offered to escort her into the house. Later, over a cup of fragrant rosehip tea that Mrs. Martin brewed, the man said that he had bought the dog for his four-year-old daughter, Cheryl. The girl was anxious about her mother's death, withdrawn into herself, and the doctors advised him to get a pet for her. But a few days ago, the dog was stolen, and Stephen, that was the man's name, did everything to find him, placed ads everywhere, even set a reward, but all to no avail. Cheryl was attached to the pet, and after his disappearance she even stopped talking, and so Stephen, in despair, decided to travel to neighbouring villages and ask maybe someone saw Sparky. And so luck smiled to him. Mrs. Martin listened to Stephen and bitterly realised that the dog would be better off with his owners, and she would be left all alone again.
Don't be upset. I'll buy you one just like him, said the grateful man. No, that's okay. Just give me a ride into the city. I do not even know whether my son will accept me, but he will definitely throw me out of the house with a dog. Mrs. Martin waved her hand, and tears streamed down her cheeks. Stephen frowned, and the woman, not knowing why, suddenly told him everything that had accumulated in her soul. The man listened to her attentively, and then got up and went to make a phone call. When he returned, he asked her how quickly she could pack. Oh, I don't have much stuff at all. Will you give me a ride into the city? Excuse me, but I have a better offer for you, he said cryptically, glancing around the small, clean kitchen with interest. What about to stay with me and my daughter? Mrs. Martin opened her mouth in surprise, and Stephen explained that his daughter had no grandmother, so the elderly woman could stay in this role if she didn't mind. You don't have to worry. In fact, you'll just be a nanny with a decent wage. I am constantly busy at work, and you are so well managed to be friends with Sparky that you will definitely succeed with Cheryl. She's a good girl. Mrs. Martin thought for a moment. She was suddenly reminded of her son's angry words, her daughter-in-law's always displeased face, and her grandson's disdainful look. The woman's eyes filled with tears, and having decided that she had nothing to lose, she agreed. Then there was a long drive into the city. The angry men's voices in the kitchen while she packed up her few belongings. The hate-filled look from her daughter-in-law. The terrible sound of her son's house front door slamming shut. And the beautiful country mansion drowned in an autumn garden. Cheryl, I found them, shouted Stephen with glee in his voice. A red-haired curly-haired girl, with a scowl on her face, came out to meet them, and immediately glowed at the sight of an older woman and a dog squealing with delight. Cheryl rushed toward them, arms outstretched wide. Sparky! Grandma! You've been found! You will never be lost again, will you? She asked with hope in her voice, barely holding back her tears. No, sweetheart, never again, whispered Mrs. Martin, and hugged the girl tightly. Tears rolled down the woman's eyes, for she suddenly realised that sometimes, in a matter of seconds, a stranger can become more kindred than the close people with whom you have lived your whole life.'